Uh, he's a poet, writer, and self-sustained, distinguished self-sustained artist in Canton of Sarajevo. Today he's a member of Association of Writers of Bosnia and Herzegovina, Association of Croatian Writers, Association of Writers of Serbia, Association of Writers of Montenegro. He is a, a member of Association of Journalists of Bosnia and Herzegovina and Association of Independent Intellectuals Circle 99 Sarajevo. Sabahuddin Hadjalic is also ambassador of Poets of the Mundo for Bosnia and Herzegovina. He is editor in chief for print and online magazines, the Info Culture Magazine and Max News Magazine. Uh, and you can see here we have uh, so, uh, four issues of Video Game Pro Culture magazine, Video Game Pro Youth magazine. Uh, these issues will be left in iOS uh, library, so for your purpose, and uh, if you need, if you want to read them, you can take them whenever you want. Also, Sabahuddin published poems, articles, essays, aphorisms, plays, and short stories in almost all major newspapers and magazines in Bosnia and Herzegovina and the region. And his poetry and prose was translated to English, French, German, Spanish, Turkish, Italian, Arabian, Estonian, Albanian, and Romanian. So I don't want to waste time or more. So please, Mr. Hajjavic, for your. Thank you very much uh, for giving me the opportunity to be part of the respectable lecturers of the International University of Sarajevo, expressing my gratitude for that as well as thanks to my colleague, uh, Mrs. Anna Jevtic, uh, who made me possible to share my thoughts and knowledge with you. People should never. Stop learning. Why? To become better one, at least. I am here, as I said, to share the knowledge, but also to learn as well. Also, I would like to underline that with intellectual 45 minutes will be very difficult to match and meet all I wanted to present to you in regard to the topic. But I will try to do my best. So thank you for coming and let's start. Mary Lure said in a poem. The words should be as pleasing to the ear as the meaning is to the mind. And also I quote myself saying, it's not difficult to write, it's difficult to know how to write. Hush, hush, my beautiful wife. In my scheduled dreams, I remember the fire in her eyes. I did not question this fairy tale character by me. The one thing that hurt me was her image displayed all over. In underground patients and drawn cable cars. I woke up to my own shadows and said, I will erase you as you never existed. She smiled and walked away towards the nearest billboard and said, you forget my story, that in the moment of my creation, all my intentions die. The beauty is in the eye of the beholder, in this case, the spectator. I took the brush and stabbed the hand that created her. There you are. Uh, Quite a century ago, the Italian poet Tuberto Salva wrote, it's high time for the poets to write an honest poetry. I think it's still time for honest poetry, as my publisher in Italy and good friend and known poet Giuseppe Napolitano have said recently. Poetry comes from our brain more than our heart, more than our feelings. You can love, wish someone with all your heart. You can express suffering, but everything must be filtered through your brain so as to establish a connection with another brain, able to revise a code and read the message, feeling it as its own. This is poetry, a communication which becomes intensity of feelings. In order to do all this, well, you have to convey a simple and understandable message, but at the same time, it must be deeply rich and open-minded. Only in so doing, those who receive it are ready to take it up. The reader can do that only if he reasons with his own brain and manages to feel the message as his own, turning it to another brain, to another sensitive reader. We should, nevertheless, to learn to love and enjoy classical poetry, past great poets' poetry, but above all, we should read with pleasure to grasp perceptions, sensations, and illusions on which honestly work so they become our own way to understand 
reality. The poet is not a natural born poet. Being a poet is not enough. We should work out our poetry day by day. And day by day, we should build up what is real mission. Only thus we can be entitled to use the name of the poet. The most obvious characteristic of the modern poetry is the desire to discover new feelings, set of thoughts and topics, as well as the desire to create a new language of poetry. It is not only a tool to explain, but also an aesthetic material. That is why, with modern poetry, technique and knowledge play an important role aside from feelings and aspiration. As the title of this lecture said, communicative discourse of modern poetry. With modern poetry, image connotation replaces search for the meaning. This is achieved by playing with the language and words. This change is the result of the rapid change of lifestyles and values, given the rapid change, of course, in technology. This approach reflects the pros and cons of our times. Nowadays, we can also feel that postmodern movement is on its way. On the other hand, the changes in the modern world are not reflected in the same place in all countries, and a poet has to consider the realities of his, her, people, and country. You should consider this fact while writing the poems. Sometimes, you should ask ourselves, which art movement is that I am following? I try to follow very well known and acknowledged poets throughout the world, as my good friend, also a known poet from Turkey, who translated as well and published some of my poems in Turkey magazines, Ali Akbili, have said, he said this quote, I have to write rhythmic poems with multiple meanings and connotations, with their roots from life. Definitely, I want my poems to put a meaning to life, he said. But let us get deeper into the main course of today's lecture and try to find out more communicative discourse of modern poetry. How we can talk about poetry and to mention communication with it. As my colleague, dear friend and poet, Alma Yertic, said at the opening of this lecture, is the poetry communication sui generis, or ever ipso communication, or the poetry is establishment of the new message without borders within the world of globalization? Poetry is the communication through words of certain experiences that can be communicated in no other way, said John Drinkwater. Is it? But to make an analysis of modern poetry within the framework of communication, is, this is not so difficult, but neither it is easy. Namely, let us put some point which can be underlined as starting point for discussion. First, why people write poetry? To send an inner message to outside world, or to release the burden of inside reflections from their souls. Second, does the communication that comes out from the written or verbal poetry means anything else than just the message of one person to another or man? And just before I continue to say that today uh, this lecture is broadcasted to the world, to the pages of the Game Pro Culture magazine, so right now, currently, besides uh, people in this session, uh, people from, from Australia to Canada are watching through the Deal Game Pro Culture Magazine live stream this lecture. So I hope that thousands watch this. Who knows? <laughs> Since communication in poetry occurs through parallelism segmentation, rather than logical and sequential communication prose, it was deemed necessary that synthetic analysis was better realized prior to poetic devices. Another question, is it? Today, we distinguish between poetry and song. Yet, for the ancient Greeks, a lyrical poem meant a song, words accompanied by a lyre. Sound, then, has always been fundamental to poetry. The word prosody is now used to define the study of poetry comes from the Greek prosodia, or a poem sung to music. The first remnant of a written poem dates, can you imagine, 2600 BC, summer. But poetry as an oral tradition is likely to have existed 
if beforehand. Well, uh, they say in the poem, it is important to keep sound in mind. Just as person may strike us as charming or untrustworthy, un untrustworthy, but not by their character, but their manner, so a poem may strike us as beautiful or jarring, not through meaning, but through sound. Take this poem, for example, by Kristina Lenkowska, also a very good friend of mine and colleague from Poland, and translated from Polish to English by Eva Krimizjewicz Jarko. And the poem said, Death is a simple thing. Death is as simple as a cradle. Both are miracles of loss and gain. In the perfect, perfect present tense, is, isn't, isn't, is. There's material evidence beyond all doubt. Methodology, way. Right? The subject is obscure at first as she contradicts herself and omits natural vocal pulses through check out this word enjambment this was very difficult for me to pronounce enjambment later on I will explain this word it's a pretty strange word even for the English people the effect is that we pause at the end of the line without finishing a complete phrase sounding as we are short of breath or being strangled by material evidence, just as the author is. So the meaning is confusing synthetically, but lucid sonically. When I use relatively obtuse terms such as tercet and adjunct, my intention is to be clear. The terminology used to describe the sonic conventions of poetry is specific and consequently vast. Knowing the terminology is helpful uh, to uh, understanding a poem, to, uh, though by, by no means necessary, it's simply the prescribed method of articulating what the poem is doing in order to manipulate your emotion. It's hardly ever useful beyond academia, but it will give you poetic authority, even if you have no idea what the poem actually means. And it's most useful. The terminology is the fastest way to convey your opinion or a poem, and the more terms you know, the more you know what to look for by reading. Before I get into analytic terms, however, it might be useful to give a quick timeline of poetry in modern English. Modern English poetry falls into several general historic categories. Renaissance, Augustan, Romantic, Victorian, Modern, Postmodern, and Contemporary. So, picture follows the, the uh, categories. Uh, Renaissance 16th century produced poets such as Thomas Campion, Christopher Marlowe, and William, of course, Shakespeare. In the 17th century, late Milton. In the Augustan period, late 17th century, uh, to early 18th century, also because of a return to the classical poetic form, uh, wrote Pope, Thomas Gray, and Samuel Johnson. The Romantic period, around the turn in the 19th century, includes Blake, Keats, Shelley, Bryan, Byron, Coleridge, and Wordsworth. The Victorian period, mid to late 19th century, uh, produced Robert Browning, Elizabeth Browning, Tennyson, and Hopkins. Then, nevertheless, the modern period, 1880 to 1950, Yeats, T.C. Eliot, Whitman, Dickinson, Wallace Stevens, and Ezra Pound. Postmoderns, roughly between 50 and 80, include William Carlos, William Bishop, uh, Clint Kinsberg, and Frank O'Hara. Of course, contemporaries, those still alive today include John Arbery, Mark Stent, Mary Liver, Billy Collins, Seamus Haney, Paul Maldon, and Jordi Graham. Many of the devices used today to analyze poetry are from Latin, Latin classification. Enjambment, for example, let's talk about it, comes from the French word to straddle, and occurs when a phrase ends not at a natural line break, but in the next line, as if to straddle the two lines. Toward the beginning of the end, a letter writes, listen to this, Insigne piatte viru, tota dire labores impulerit, tantaene animes talvestis irae. This is obviously Latin, not English. 
But even without any knowledge of the language, one can see how the phrase does not enter naturally and laborious. But in the next line, emphasizing impolerity, which happens to be the main word. In this same excerpt is an example for the seazura, another important poetic device that derives from Latin verse. A seazura is a vocal pause, often indicated by a comma or a period, that breaks a line into two halves. It is commonly used to contrast ideas. In Latin poetry, seazura may only occur between the first and fourth feet of a poem a food consisting of two to three vowel sounds. Additionally, in Latin, Cezura must break up a food. In the example above, the Cezura occurs at the period of the Ipolemid. Welcome. If in pu or le is the first food, it is ductile, but uh, that will be explained later. Then it done is the second foot, spondee, with the period standing in the middle, acting as siazura. In modern, of course, English poetry, a siazura is generally used to mean any pause within the line, for matter is not as prospective as it was in Vir Virgil's days. The ionic is written in dactylic hexameter, which means that every line has six feet, and every fifth foot must be, what, dactyl. Anaphora is a term used to describe repetition, deriving from the Greek word to bring back. The Latin poet Catullus used it in line 63 play. Listen to this. Ego mulier, ego adolescence, ego ephebus, ego puer. Without knowing Latin, we are struck by the word ego, showing the significance of sound even before comprehension in poetry. Ego, or ego, is I in Latin. And as you have right, right, rightly assumed, ancestral to English word ego. A favorite a Latin device of mine is the chiasmus, another word known in English. Latin is remarkable for its sentence structure. The ancients appear to have thrown their verbs and nouns around wherever they please, resulting in some unique poetic devices. A chiasmus derived from the Greek word for a cross, occurs when a sentence or, or a phrase follows an ABBA structure, A-B-B-A -B -B -A structure. As it is, listen to this, ask not what your country can do for you, but what you can do for your country. Remember, Kennedy. Uh, a stands for your country, and B, A means stands for your country, <coughs> and B is for you. The most famous example of a chiasmus in antiquity is Catullus poem 85, a brief two lines that read, listen to this, Odiet amo, quare faciam pot gassere quiris, messio se fieri sentio et exurior. If you don't know Latin, that sounds like a whole lot of mumbo jumbo, you know? But one thing might have stood out. The booklet were pairs, Odiet amo and sentio et extrusio. Without knowing Latin, we hear a repetition that encloses the two Bs. Translating these word pairs read, I hate and I love, and I feel and I'm crucified. The negative verbs, the, the A's, enclose the loving, emotional verbs, the Bs. This poem is a double chiasmus, crossing in sound and meaning, in addition, excusio, which sounds harsh without knowing Latin, means I'm crucified. Contributing even more to the imagery of a cross implied by chiasmus, draw a line between sentio and amo, and another between excusio and odi. C shows the cross. If these Latin devices interested you, you might want to read further about litotis, metonymy, synodoki, and elegiac, elegiac words. With the exception of elegiac words, a method which seldom appears in English poetry, these terms are not sonic devices, but figurative, and so I will not attempt to demonstrate them. They are very fun to pull out in conversation, however, so I suggest just to Google them. I mentioned much about feet while demonstrating the censure. Feet are fundamental, really. The feet are fundamental, 
uh, to matter in both Latin and English poetry. We use the same categories that the Romans did for Scansion, or the method of determining a poem's matter. There are three main types of a feat. A yam, a trochee, and a spondee. A yam is an unstressed vowel sound followed by a stressed a trochee. Is the inverse, a stressed vowel sound followed by an unstressed. And a spondee is two stressed vowel sounds. What is two unstressed vowel sounds called, you may ask? This is a less common and called a pyrrhic food. Remember, uh, the word pyrrhic comes from the Greek leader Pyrrhicus, who invented the dance or Pyrrhicus victory, if you will remember the famous Pyrrhicus uh, victory when somebody won the game, but uh, a lot of losses he uh, had uh, before he won the game. Uh, what uh, went to the sessions of sweet silent thought? Shakespeare said this went to the sessions of sweet, silent thought. The first foot went to is a stressed vowel and an unstressed. A trochee, the second. The ses is an unstressed, then a stressed, a yamp. The third, the ions of, is two unstressed, a pyrrhic foot, and the last two feet, sweet C and blend thought are both two stressed vowels, or spondees. The matter of the line feels fast in the beginning but once it hits the stress from these, vocally, vocally we must slow down the words in order to hit the stress, giving way to sweet, silent, so. Even if Shakespeare is somewhat complicated in his diction, his matter will often direct his point. Also use an English, English is ductile, or one stress vowel followed by two unstressed, and the less common anapest than verse, who unstressed uh, unstressed vowels followed by unstressed. The first line, listen to this, of Tennyson's The Charge of the Light Brigade contains two dactyls. Half a league, half a league. While William Cooper's verse is supposed to be written by Alexander Selkirk contains three anapists in the line, I am out of humanity's reach. Compare the dactyl stressed, unstressed, unstressed in half a league, with the anapest unstressed, unstressed, and stressed in I am out. The first is forceful, the second sounds near impotent, out of control. The matter directly correlates with the meaning of the poems. Tennyson's describes a charge, cowpers, and strangling. When people comment that Shakespeare writes in iambic pentameter, they mean that his lines favor a iambic cadence, using other feet only to shift the motion and are five feet to a line. Plenty in a yamping, the diameter will be two feet to a line. Three feet is tri trimeter, four is tetrameter, five is pentameter, and six is hexameter. The charge of the light brigade, two feet per line and fibering, fibering, fibering dactyls, is an example of dactylic diameter. So, at the end of the day, what poetry requires if we are heading for the conclusion of the communicative discourse modern poetry? So, First, poetry requires creativity. Poetry requires emotion. Poetry requires an artistic quality. And of course, poetry requires logic. Also, communication is within sound devices. Having in mind that poetry, believe it or not, use both sides of your brain. You know that one side of the brain are for the logic, another side of the brain are for something else. Creativity, for example. Uh, left that covers logic and reality, and right that covers creativity and emotions. If we go through th those examples, rhymes, example, head, cat, breath, fat, met, set, or rhythm, the beat. When reading a poem out loud, you may notice a sort of sing song quality to it, just like in nursery rhymes. This is accomplished by the use of rhythm. Rhythm is broken into seven times lambic, anapestic, trochaic, dactylic monosyllabic, spondaic, and accentual. So we go further on, to meter, the length of a line of poetry, based on what type of rhythm is used. The length of a line of poetry is measured in metrical units called feet. Each foot consists of one unit of rhythm. So if the line of iambic is trochaic, a foot of poetry has two syllables. If the line is anapestic or dactylic, a foot of poetry 
has three syllabus. When you later on go to your university library and be able to go through the magazine, uh, the European Pro Culture and the European Pro Art and the European Pro Youth, you'll be able to see, besides uh, be astonished, I hope so, with so many poets from, for example, 270, uh, 272 poets from 60 countries of the world in their own language. So you will be able to read and to, to compare what I just said about the, the different kind of using of the verbs and, and uh, presentation categories of the poetry. So I, I wish you all the best trying to find out everything what I've said, the meanings of the, within, within those poems. That's why uh, the slogan of the magazine, which I'm editing, is we are unifying diversities. And it's not only diversities about the people, also diversities within the poetry. That's why I'm talking about a different kind of poetry within the poetry. This is where it's going to start sounding like a geometry class, of course. Uh, uh, so you left brainers are going to love this. I hope that uh, you're going to use both sides. Each set of syllabus is one foot, and each line is measured by how many feet are in it. The length of the line of poetry is then labeled according to how many feet are in it. For example, one meter, diameter, three meter, tetrameter, pentameter, hexameter, heptameter, and octameter. Then we come to the alliteration. That means the repetition of the initial letter or sound in two or more words of a line. To, to the lay person, these are called tongue twisters. Example, how much dew would a dew drop drop in a dew drop did drop dew? This is alliteration. Onomatopoeia. Words that spell out sounds, words that sound like what they mean, examples. Grow, his pop, boom, crack, psh. Repetition, using the same keyword or phrase throughout the poem. Refrain, repetition of one or more phrases or lines at the end of stanza. It can also be an entire stanza that is repeated periodically throughout the poem. Kind of like a, a, a chorus of a song. And we come to simile. That's a co comparison between two usually unrelated things using the word like or as. For example, I usually always use examples. Joe is hungry as a bear. In the morning, Re is like an angry lion. Metaphor. An implied comparison between two usually unrelated things. For example, we have Lenny is a snake. Ginny is a mouth when it comes to standing up for herself. The difference between a simile and a metaphor is that a simile requires either like or as to be included in the comparison. And the metaphor requires that neither be used. Hyperbole, an exaggeration for the sake of emphasis. Examples, I may sweep to death. The blood bank needs a river of blood. Personification, giving human characteristic to inanimate objects, ideas, or animals. For example, the sun stretches its lazy fingers over the valley. Or symbol, a word or image that signifies something other than what is literally represented. Examples. Dark or black images in poems are often used to symbolize death. Light or white images are often used to symbolize life. Imagery, using words to create a picture in the reader's mind. And free verse, poetry that, fo that follows no rules, just about, about anything goes. For example, point fog. The fog comes on a little catch feet. It sits looking over harbor and city, on silent haunches, and then moves on. No rhyme, no rhythm, no meter. This above is free verse. Allusions, a reference to another piece of literature or to history. Can you imagine how many things you can find within the poetry? How many categories, how many reflections, how many swords within itself you, it can be presented? Because uh, for me, my, my personal opinion as a poet and uh, as also a lecturer is always that it's uh, it's, uh, it's pretty unbelievably true that the poetry is even everything what we have by using both sides of the brain. Because later on you will even see what Albert Einstein said also about the poetry. Allusions. A reference to another piece of literature or to history. Example, she had Diane's wit from Romeo and Juliet. This is an allusion to Roman mythology and the goddess Diana. The, the three most common types of allusions refer to mythology, the Bible, and Shakespeare's writings. Oxymoron, for example. As with many other literary and historical devices, oxymorons are used for a variety of purposes. Sometimes they are used to create some sort of drama uh, for the reader or listener, 
And sometimes they are used to make the person stop and think. Whether it's to laugh or to ponder. Listen to this. Great depression. Jumbo shrimp. Cruel to be kind. Painful pleasure. Clearly confused. Act naturally. Beautifully painful. Painfully beautiful. Defining silence. Types of poetry are dramatic poetry, dramatized action through dialogue or monologue, narrative poetry, poetry tells a story, and lyrical poetry expresses personal thoughts and emotions. Communicative discourse of modern poetry is then to conclude, it's my opinion, writing that uses heightened, compressed language dependent on metaphor to communicate ideas and emotions. Discourse is most not worthy for its use of language, language that pushes, pushes the envelope or goes beyond everyday usage. As Albert Einstein said, pure mathematics is in its way the poetry of logical ideas. Can you imagine more clear explanation that comes to the both sides of our brain, that covers the logic and creativity and what defined by Albert Einstein. Poetry is of course, again, my opinion, somebody will probably disagree with me, is the most misunderstood form of writing. It is also, arguably, the poorest form of writing. Poetry is a sense of the beautiful, characterized by love of beauty and expressing this through words. It is art. Like art, it's very difficult to define because it's an expression of what the poet thinks and feels and may take any form the poet chooses for this expression. Poetry is not easily defined. Often it takes the form of verse, but not all poetry has this structure. Poetry is a creative use of words which, like all art, is intended to steer an emotion in the audience. Poetry generally has, come, has some structure that separates it from prose. Some might consider the study of poetry old-fashioned, yet even in our hurried lives we are surrounded by light. Children's rhymes, verses from songs, uh, tried commercial jingles, well-written texts. Any time we recognize words as interesting for sound, meaning for success, we note poetry. This is communicative discourse of modern poetry. Also, to make long story short, poetry, communication, is the art of saying the unsaid. Just to say this. Well, poetry communication is the art of saying of the unsaid. So, thank you for your attention. Uh, so, what is communication? This is modern poetry or something else. So, was this a lesson or just a hint of communication within the poetry? So, what is a poetry communication agenda or just a short fiction? And I would like to quote Yunus Emre, the famous Turkish poet from the 13th century. If I told you about an end of love, love, friend, would you follow me and come? So if there is a, just a hint from my side to you today to be able to go deeper into the poetry, I think we can quote the line of famous Yunusev. Thank you very much. As I said, uh, uh, this annual edition of uh, Video Game Pro Culture Magazine, which has 300 pages, will be given to uh, colleague uh, uh, Alma to be given to the, and you will be able to see 80 poets are here. Uh, you have essays, you have uh, uh, reviews of the books from around the world. Almost for 40 countries from the world are here. Video Game Pro Culture Magazine is a worldwide magazine, and also you will find also some Turkish poets as well here. And also, another thing, this is the number three, this is the Video Game Pro Youth magazine. This is the first edition. Uh, my deputy editor, also I would like to say that uh, Alma Yertic is deputy editor for the culture of her members. The deputy editor for the youth, Goran Verhunz, edit, edited this issue. Of, uh, that means the young poets are presented here. And also there is a third, can you imagine, uh, like, like an S-Coffee, three in one. Uh, uh, we have three magazines in one, Diogen Pro Youth, Diogen Pro Culture, Diogen Pro Art. You can pro art for almost 40 issues, presents the artist, for example, if I tell you that we presented Pablo Picasso with a, with a bro from the Zurich Museum last year, uh, presented the selected art, <coughs> artists in, uh, from around the world. You have all magazines online, of course, on the site of Diogen, but for example, this copy is from Gustavo Vega from Spain. 
That means the whole pages are dedicated to him. And also every month, 40, 40 issues have been so far. So those three issues are given from my heart to the University of Virginia Society. Again, thank you very much. If you have any kind of questions, you're more than welcome. But uh, to know a little bit more about me, uh, as I usually say, that somebody invites me to Google. <laughs> okay, thank you very much, Mr. Hadjavik. So are there any questions? Well, maybe I can just make a comment. <laughs> it was uh, interesting when you said that uh, art is, uh, poetry is art of saying unsaid. And what, what comes to mind is, is uh, uh, you know, uh, Gossian and said Darwinkers. If you read them, I, I believe that there's always more unsaid than said. Yes, yes. So it's, it's an excellent uh, example also from this. <laughs> yes, yes. yes. Right. But the poetry itself is like that. Yes. Uh, any, from any country, not only from Bosnia, from all countries of the world, it's, it's an art of saying unsaid. That's why people, uh, and I also, when I write poetry like that, to try to say what has been unsaid in a different kind of ways. Yeah. Thank you for your comment. Other questions, comments, suggestions? What was the, the saying by, uh, from uh, Einstein, if you can you can repeat that? Uh, uh, I will just return back because I, I don't know it by heart, but it's very interesting. Uh, I will just hold it here. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, okay. It says pure mathematics is in its uh, way the poetry of logical ideas. It's amazing. Mm -hmm. uh, if, if, if we're going to define this, uh, that means the mathematics, the people who use the, the, the website of the brain, uh, you, they use the, the, the ideas, the logical ideas, ideas to define some uh, formulas and everything. And that's the poetry. Whatever you, you do, you can find this pure mathematics here and use it to, to the poetry. More questions? Yes. Okay, there are no more questions. I'd like to thank you for your attendance. And also, I would like to invite you to the first, first International Symposium on Cultural Remembrance that will be organized in April 2014 here at the IUS in cooperation with the Oriental Culture Magazine. Yes, that's an excellent uh, uh, introductory word from uh, I will just abuse again position being a speaker here to say that's an excellent cooperation between my colleague uh, Yevtic and myself uh, and also of course with the International University of Sarajevo. It's on, on the site of theogenpro.com you will be able to find out from the uh, 24th of November the invitation, open invitation for sending the, the call for papers. So you'll be able to see to, uh, the, the, the symposium is the culture of remembrance and Bosnia and Herzegovina, the uh, new awakening or twilight. That uh, we're going to discuss a lot of different things related to the art, philosophy, poetry, sociology, politics, and everything. And we are expecting a very good keynote speakers. It's, it's uh, some, uh, some still uh, hidden by our side, but we are expecting uh, famous people from abroad to come. But we'll see. Thank you very much.
the magazine the world. directly. 
I'm